deal with four questions, one of which is, what do freedom of expression and intellectual freedom mean? The second is, why is intellectual freedom essential? The third is, what are the limits to those freedoms, and what does hate speech mean in Canada? And fourthly, for library staff who may see this afterwards, what does this all mean for public library staff? As well, woven through this talk, I'm going to be making three key points. The first is that intellectual freedom is a fundamental human right. Second is libraries play a vital societal role uh, to make intellectual freedom possible. We can't overstate the importance of public libraries in our democratic society at the moment. And lastly, the uh, third major point is that censorship is an ineffective, often counterproductive way of remedying social problems. So let's start with question number one. What do intellectual freedom of expression and intellectual freedom mean? Well, they mean, as you see on the screen, the right to express one's views, as well as to seek and receive information without interference. So it's two parts. It's to get to speak, but it's also your right to hear. It's the right to uh, express yourself in a variety of means. Uh, I prefer the term freedom of expression rather than freedom of speech, because expression can take many forms. It can be oral, but it can be in writing, it can be in artwork. I have friends who are sculptors. It can be in drama. It can be in any medium of your choice. As well, freedom of expression includes both the content of what you have to say, as well as the manner of expression. You actually are interfering with a person's freedom of expression. You say, well, you have a right to say it, but you can't say it angrily. Because maybe your message, I mean, if I were a black person in Canada and exposed to some of the racism of black people, I'd be angry about that. And so to express some of that anger is part of the expression, to say, uh, you know, in a very quiet, subdued voice, well, I'm very unhappy with racism in Canada, conveys a different message than saying what I really feel. So that's a sense of what intellectual freedom and freedom of expression refer to. The second question is why is intellectual freedom essential? And I think there are four reasons. The first is by being able to express ourselves, it's how we become who we are. I have some young grandchildren, and they'll say some things, and I'll say, no, that's not right, we'll go back and forth. And through your whole life, you'll say things, and your friends, or your partner, or your parents will say, no, that's wrong, or that's right. Uh, you try out ideas on people, you get feedback. And we continue to develop as people, and we only can do that if we have an opportunity to express ourselves. It's also, secondly, crucial for advancement of knowledge. I spent most of my life as a university professor. Most of what in my field is taken for granted, or in fact, most academic fields is taken for granted today, was either unimaginable 100 years ago, or was seen as heretical, or stupid, or whatever. We, we move forward by trying out new ideas, challenging conventional wisdom. Uh, a lot of times we're wrong, and we learn things when we're wrong, but a lot of times we're right. Uh, and so that ability to to express new ideas, to challenge conventional wisdom, is really part of how we advance our knowledge. And thirdly, and for me maybe one of the two most important, is it underpins democracy. A, genuine, a genuine democracy is not primarily about the rule of law. It's about an ongoing public discourse as to what's legitimate and what's not legitimate in a society. We have the right to raise questions about it, to challenge, to try to change it. We have a right to speak out about it, get in debates about it, get into discussions. That's the heart of democracy. And so freedom of expression, if, it, if there isn't the kind of intellectual freedom to hear, 
and to speak, it really undermines the public discourse that's essential for democracy. That's why libraries play such an important role as I'm going to talk about, because they're a way in which the pub public can get access to all sorts of information and ideas and so forth. And fourthly, uh, intellectual freedom is fundamental for social justice. Oftentimes people talk about freedom of expression is antithetical to social justice. And a lot on the right who, uh, like the convoy people who invaded Ottawa and uh, made life hell for the people who lived in Ottawa, their slogan was freedom. Well, the, what, what social justice is about is giving voice to everyone in society. Um, it's, it's not, I mean, genuine freedom is only a freedom if you can exercise it. So saying everybody theoretically has a right to express themselves is different from creating a circumstance in which everyone has a genuine right to express themselves. Because it's those who are marginalized, who often are victims of conventional wisdom, of majoritarian ideas. And unless you have a society where it's legitimate to raise questions about what the majority thinks, uh, there's not a chance of achieving social justice in any meaningful way. I mean, those are the four reasons I think that intellectual freedom is absolutely essential. Now, the first of my key points, intellectual freedom is a fundamental human right. It's not a right that governments have given you. It's a right that you have as a result of being a human being. This is recognized in a remarkable document that was adopted by the United Nations uh, General Assembly in 1948. And it's called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And Article 19 of that declaration says, as you can see on the screen, everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. This was a made, this adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was a, a major achievement for the fledgling United Nations in 1948. And it speaks to how fundamental it is. It's not just a political right that governments give us, it's a human right. Liu Xiaobo, one of the great human rights activists of the last century, was a Chinese literary critic, a writer, professor, human rights activist who spent the last 20 years of his life in jail uh, in China. And when he was awarded the Nobel Prize, I think it was in 2016, um, China didn't allow him to go. So the Nobel Committee, when they did the presentation, had an empty chair in front uh, to signify that he was getting it, in some ways dramatizing uh, the reason he was getting it. And what he said uh, says, I think, powerfully what I was trying to say. Freedom of expression is the base of human rights, the root of human nature and the mother of truth. To kill free speech is to insult human rights, to stifle human nature, and to suppress truth. Now, my second key point is that libraries play a vital societal role in making intellectual freedom possible. If you think about it, public libraries are becoming an increasingly unique public institution in our society. As more and more of what's in the public domain is securitized, you know, what I have to go through and to go, to, go through to get into the parliament of Canada or into, the, uh, into Queen's Park. And if I wander down the wrong hall, somebody grabs me. Or if I hang around, the libraries are one of the few public places where you can go in at the moment they open, stay until it closes, nobody asks you for money, and you have a right to be there, whether you're a homeless person or the wealthiest person in the community, whether you have views that the majority of people hate or love, a place where you can get information that's not censored, but chosen by selection criteria that librarians use to try to meet the needs of the community. It really is a unique public institution. Uh, and it's a unique source of information so vital to people and in an age where so much disinformation pours forth over social media and the internet, you don't know what to trust, and the legacy media are having increasing financial problems because their monetary uh, business model has really fallen into the toilet as a result of Google and Facebook gobbling up 75% of all avenue, uh, advertising revenue. Public libraries are a free place in which the public can get access to information uh, of a variety of sorts. And, uh, and in that sense, it's just an irreplaceable institution. Why is it that libraries have this commitment to intellectual freedom? I'm, I'm, I want to suggest there's two reasons. One, 
It's because of their own policies and values. And secondly, it's because of their obligations under Canada's constitution, our Charter of Rights and Values. The Canadian, Feder uh, Canadian Federation of Library Associations has a statement on intellectual freedom, which reads, libraries have a core responsibility to safeguard and facilitate access to constitutionally protected expressions of knowledge, imagination, ideas, and opinion, including those with which some individuals and groups consider unconventional, unpopular, or unacceptable. That uh, document goes on to say, libraries make, their, make available their public spaces and services to individuals and groups without discrimination. In accordance with their mandates and professional values and standards, libraries provide, defend, and promote equitable access to the widest possible variety of expressive content and resist calls for censorship and the adoption of systems that deny or restrict access to resources. Canadian Association uh, that brings together public li or libraries from across the country have this firm value that's expressed in their statement on intellectual freedom. But also internationally, this isn't just a Canadian or North American phenomenon, it's an international commitment that libraries from around the world make. And the Inter International Federation of Libraries um, has uh, its own statement on intellectual freedom, which is quite similar. Libraries shall ensure that the selection and availability of library materials and services is governed by professional considerations and not by political, moral, or religious views. In other words, we choose on criteria, selection criteria adopted by the library not to please a particular political orientation or religious orientation or moral viewpoint. Libraries shall acquire, organize, and disseminate information freely and oppose any form of censorship. Libraries shall make materials, facilities, and services equally available to all users. There shall be no discrimination due to race, creed, gender, age, or for any other reason. So people you may find detestable who live in this community still have a right to come to the library and use it, look for their information. Uh, and the library is to serve them as well as you or me. Librarians and other employees have a duty to uphold these principles. So that's the fundamental statement of the International Federation. And the Oakville Public Library has, in a number of its policy documents, versions of this wording that I took from one of them, and that is the OPL respects the principles and intellectual, of intellectual freedom and freedom of expression as outlined in the Canadian Federation of Library Association's intellectual uh, freedom, uh, statement on intellectual freedom in libraries. So your own policy reflects the views that I've just described. But there's another reason why it's important Libraries, uh, I mean, our charter, our charter of rights and freedoms, says the uh, section two identifies what freedom our fundamental freedoms in this country, and section two B is the key one, and that is freedom of thought, belief, opinion, and expression, including freedom of the press and other media of communication. Now I cite that our constitution to you because libraries are obliged to operate in a manner consistent with our Constitution, and should they not, they can be challenged in court. The Charter describes uh, to whom the Charter applies. So Section 32 of the Charter specifies it applies to legislatures and governments of each province in respect of all matters within the authority of the legislature of each province. Now, if you understand what that legalese means, you're doing well. What it means is that if you operate under a law that has its origin either federally or provincially, then the charter applies to your organization. In Ontario, like the rest of Canada, public libraries are governed by provincial library acts, bringing them under the auspices of the charter. So if the library were to refuse services or to uh, censor books on a certain, uh, because a certain group in your community didn't like, they were too right-wing or too left-wing, uh, you actually uh, are violating the charter and can be held responsible as an institution in the courts. Now, question number three, what are the limits to these freedoms? And what does hate speech mean in Canada? There are lots of limits on freedom of expression. The criminal code has limits that I'm gonna talk about, uh, but your municipality has municipal bylaws. You don't have the freedom of expression to play your, uh, your music at 130 decibels at two in the morning. You don't have the right to defame people. You don't have the right to engage in fraud. You don't have a right to threaten violence or to uh, engage in violence, beat somebody up and say, well, I'm just expressing my anger at them. Uh, 
So there are all sorts of limits in a democratic society to freedom of expression, but they are limits that there's a fairly high bar to get over them. And the one around which there's the most confusion, I think, these days, uh, I mean, I've just mentioned some of those, um, the, the, there's the most confusion around is hate speech. So this was uh, Chief Justice, then Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin, and she wrote in a case of R versus Sharp, uh, this was seven years ago, uh, she wrote on behalf of the entire court the following, amongst the most fundamental rights possessed by Canadians, it's freedom of expression. It makes possible our liberty, our creativity, and our democracy. It does this by protecting not only good and popular expression, but also unpopular or even offensive expression. The right to freedom of expression rests in the conviction that the best route to truth, individual flourishing, and peaceful coexistence in a heterogeneous society in which people hold divergent and conflicting beliefs lies in the free flow of ideas and images. If we do not like an idea or an image, we are free to argue against it or simply turn away. But absent some constitutionally adequate justification, we cannot forbid a person from expressing it. Because of the importance of the guarantee of free expression, any attempt to restrict the right must be subjected to the most careful scrutiny. And the term the most careful, careful scrutiny is judge speak for saying there's a very high bar that has to be gotten over before uh, your right to express your views can be limited uh, in our legal system. So let's, let's talk about hate speech. Uh, we hear increasingly, partly as a result of all the stuff that pours out of the internet and social media, uh, there's, the federal government is under enormous pressure to do something about the amount of hate speech and disinformation and whatever that's coming forward. And it's wrestling with it. And for reasons I'll talk about later, really doesn't know what to do about it. And is likely to do some bad things. We have to find a way to deal with it, but how they're approaching it, I think it's not gonna work very well. But in any case, let's look at hate speech. In Canada, hate speech is prohibited in two ways. It's prohibited by the Criminal Code of Canada. And in three provinces, it's prohibited by the Human Rights Act in British Columbia, Alberta, and Saskatchewan, as well as in the Northwest Territories. The other provinces don't. The federal uh, human rights legislation used to have a provision against hate speech, which was taken out uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, and it was taken out because it felt that limiting uh, speech, ch the charge of hate speech, was a, such a serious one that it should be done under the criminal code rather than under human rights law. In any case, there's two sections of the, of the uh, criminal code that talk about hate speech, and I want to be clear with you what it means. Because around the university, I hear frequently someone describes, well, you know, what Jeff said is hate speech, or what Jim said is hate speech. Um, and what they mean is they were offended by it, they didn't like it, they thought it uh, was denigrating to them in some way, uh, it was unfriendly, uh, or whatever. Well, hate speech in Canada has a very specific meaning. It's important to understand that if we're going to understand how we deal with it. So Section 319.1 of the Criminal Code, define, that's one of the two grounds of something becoming hate speech, is everyone who, by communicating statements in any public place, so it has to occur in a public place, what you say to your partner at home or whatever is, cannot be legally hate speech under this provision. Secondly, it incites hatred against an identi any identifiable group. And the third is where that incitement is likely to lead to a breach of the peace. If all three of those things aren't there, it doesn't fall under this provision. So you can say something that's hateful, that may get people aroused, but if it isn't likely to lead to a uh, breach of the peace, then it doesn't constitute hate speech. The second provision is 319.2, which says everyone who by commuting communicating statements other than in private conversations, so again, not, it has to be public, willfully promotes hatred against any identifiable group. So the second provision, if you willfully promote hatred against another group, then you're guilty of hate speech. Now, the problem with law is what do those words mean, right? That's why we have courts. Courts have to decide. So if, if I say, uh, to, if I make a, a remark that's, denigrates a particular group of people, am I willfully promoting hatred against them or not? So it depends on the facts of the situation, but the courts have 
uh, because of the number of hate speech cases that have worked their way up the Supreme Court, we have a clear sense of what the law means by this term willfully promotes hatred. There was a case in the, in the Nova Scotia Provincial Court 10 years ago now, uh, where three young people, two young people, had been spray painting hateful messages around uh, Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, and were arrested. In the course of the decision, Mr. Justice Jamie Campbell, who's now in the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia, wrote uh, for, the, for the purpose of the decision a clarification of what constitutes hate speech under the section I was just reading to you. And he wrote, hate speech under 3192 involves the promotion of hatred not the expression or manifestation of it. Promotion in this context means actively supporting or instigating hatred. The Supreme Court of Canada has determined that promotion goes beyond encouragement. In other words, it is not a criminal act to encourage people to hate. An act of hatred or a hateful comment could act as an example or an encouragement to others by emboldening them. Promotion must go beyond uttering hate-filled comments. Well, it helps a bit, but maybe not enough. So I'm going to cite two Supreme Court cases, one involving the criminal code, one involving hate, uh, one involving uh, the human rights code, where the co court is even clearer about what constitutes hate speech. The, this is a classic decision. It was in 1990. The, uh, Mr. Justice Dixon was the chief justice at the time. He wrote this decision. Uh, the case was R versus Keekstra. Jim Keekstra was a high school teacher in Eckville, Alberta, a little town in Alberta. He was a virulent, anti-Semite, disgusting anti-Semite. And when he taught in his class, he not only expressed his anti-Semitism, but it required his students to spit it back to him. And he was fired, as he properly should have been. Two years later, he was charged with hate speech. And his case, over 12 years, went through the courts. Uh, finally, the Supreme Court. And this is the decision that was written. As Corey J.A. stated in R. versus Andrews, which was another case that happened the same year that the Supreme Court dealt with, Justice Corey wrote, hatred is not a word of casual connotation. To promote hatred is to instill detestation, enmity, ill will, and malevolence in another. Clearly an expression must go a long way before it qualifies within the definition of the criminal code. And then he goes on, hatred is predicated on destruction and hatred against any identifiable group therefore thrives on insensitivity, bigotry, and the destruction of both the target group and the values of our society. Hatred in this sense is a most extreme emotion that belies reason. An emotion that if exercised against members of an identifiable group implies that those individuals are to be despised, scorned, denied respect, and made subject to ill treatment on the basis of group affiliation. Expression that portrays a group of people as subhuman, as not deserving to be treated as human beings. It has to be that extreme is what our laws are trying to protect against. Now, let me take the human rights case, which where the, the most recent hate speech uh, decision of the Supreme Court was in 2013. It's the case I'm about to tell you. Um, the language in the human rights codes, the three that have it, have, are essentially similar, with one exception. 3.1 says you can't publish issue or display or cause to be published, issue, display, whatever, uh, any symbol, sign, notice, etc. That B says, is likely to expose a person or a class of persons to hatred or contempt. So that's what the Human Rights Code prevents. But again, what does that mean, likely to expose a person to hatred uh, or, or contempt? I mean, there's any number of things that could do that. I could write a little, put up a little poster saying so-and-so is a real jerk. So what, what does that mean? Well, they had to address that um, in a classic case, the earliest case they had to address, and I'll get to the most recent one. And this was the Canadian Human Rights Commission against Taylor. Because this was 1990 where there's still a provision against hate speech in the Canadian Human Rights Code. And Chief Justice Dixon wrote that decision as well. And he said the phrase hatred or contempt in the context of the Canadian Human Rights Act refers only to ex unusually strong and deeply felt emotions of detestation, calumny, and vilification. Now, some people have argued that Supreme Court justices must sit with the thesaurus to come up with all these different synonyms for what they're trying to express. Um, the most recent case uh, involved a charge under the, Canadian, under the Saskatchewan Human Rights Code by a fundamentalist preacher in Saskatchewan named William Watcott. And Watcott wrote three, four pamphlets that were deemed to be seriously homophobic. 
And so he was hauled before the Human Rights Tribunal in Saskatchewan, and it was found, it was found that all four of his pamphlets were genuinely homophobic. The provision under which he charged was in the, the code which says that in Saskatchewan, the wording says that these images, booklets, whatever you create, uh, are not appropriate if they expose or tend to expose to hatred, but they added, or ridicules, belittles, or otherwise affronts the dignity of any person or class of persons on the basis of a prohibited ground. So he was charged with uh, hatred, ridiculing, or belittling, and affronting LGBTQ people uh, as a result of what he wrote. So in the decision, and the case is called Saskatchewan Human Rights versus Watcott, uh, Mr. Justice Rothstein, writing on behalf of a unanimous court, wrote the following. The legislative term hatred or hatred or contempt must be interpreted as being restricted to those extreme manifestations of the emotion described by the words detestation and vilification. You notice a theme here, detestation, vilification, expression. And then they go on to say expression in the words of the Saskatchewan Code that ridicules, belittles, or otherwise affronts the dignity of does not rise to the level of ardent and extreme feelings constituting hatred required to uphold the constitutionality of a prohibition of expression in human rights legislation. Consequently, they are constitutionally invalid and must be struck from the code. In other words, they ruled that it's unconstitutional to define hatred to not only include uh, detestation and vilification, but also ridiculing or belittling or affronting the dignity of another person. That's too broad a definition of hatred and it is actually contrary to the constitutional protection. And so Saskatchewan had to rewrite its code. In my view, uh, Rothstein uh, continues, detestation and vilification aptly describe the harmful effect the code seeks to eliminate. Representations that expose a target group to detestation tend to inspire enmity and extreme ill will against them, which goes beyond mere disdain and dislike. Representations vilifying a person or group will seek to abuse, denigrate, and de or delegitimize them, to render them lawless, dangerous, unworthy, or unacceptable in the eyes of the audience. Expression exposing vulnerable groups to detestation and vilification goes far beyond merely discrediting, humiliating, or offending the victims. So our court is very clear that we, you know, we, we don't want to encourage harmful or hurtful language, but the criminal code is a very big stick and should only be used on extreme versions of speech that is harmful. And in the case of hate speech, only hate speech that meets the qualifications as specified here. And does not mean that if I don't say hello to somebody walking down the hall, or if I say to somebody who in, in a conversation puts forward a new idea, and I say, what a stupid idea, are you a jerk? Uh, those kinds of things, he may feel that's hateful and it's certainly offensive but it, it's not something we deal with under criminal law. Now my third key point, and I think this is the heart of the matter, is that censorship is an ineffective, often counterproductive way of remedying social problems. Because really what we're talking about in all of these, when people make challenges to books and libraries, when they object to who you, whom you've uh, rented space to, uh, they don't like a program or a speaker you're having, or when they don't want someone to be able to publish what they're saying or writing. It is, it is they're asking for censorship. Um, and one of, the, one of the universal phenomena of people who want to censor is they always want to do it for a good reason. If you look through the history of the human race, even the most, what we would see today as really detestable forms of extreme censorship like the Spanish Inquisition, Spanish Inquisition when people were actually being put to death. It was to save their souls. It was to rid the world of heretics. It was for a good. So one of the reasons it's hard to often talk about censorship for somebody who's really keen to censor uh, is they, in their own minds, are doing it for a good reason. One of the problems with censorship is it can't capture what it wants to prevent. It's always too broad or too narrow. So at Toronto Metropolitan University, which used to be Ryerson, where I work. I frequently hear students say, we shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, experience racism in the university. We shouldn't be exposed to racist speech, uh, encounter racism in any form. 
And some of the right say, oh, come on, get a life. You know, you gotta live in the real world. What are you, snowflakes or whatever? And that's the absolute wrong response. The right response is, yes, you should not experience racism in the university. But censorship isn't the way we fix the problem. We could eliminate all the racist speech in the world and we'd still have racism. Uh, and in fact, by thinking we're getting rid of it by censoring speech, we're avoiding dealing with the serious ways we have to deal with it, like the fundamental econ economic inequality in our society, the deeply flawed criminal justice system. How do you fix those things? That's much harder than trying to create an environment where people don't feel comfortable expressing their racist views and thinking that's gonna solve the problem. I, I'm just reminded uh, of, of a person I quite respect. His name is Henry Louis Gates Jr. And he's one of the most eminent African-American intellectuals in the United States. He's professor, a very senior professor at Harvard, heads a center of African-American studies. And in a book he wrote some years ago, he talked about um, the whole issue of censorship. You know, when I'm, when I'm talking in the middle of Harvard Yard with a group of my students who are all black and somebody comes by and says you and says the N word, he said, that actually, you know, we know what that person is, they're what they are, we disregard them. What's more hurtful is when I'm standing with that same group of students and one of their white friends comes up and says, Jesus, nice to see all of you. You know, Harvard is such a better place because people like you are able to be here and that we have affirmative action policies that let people like you be at Harvard. And we're so, I'm so happy to see you. He said, that's far more hurtful than some jerk who utters the epithet who. But if you try to censor racist speech, how do you capture both the epithet and the many forms of what people call microaggressions? You know, if I walk down the hall and say hello to every white colleague and walk by every black colleague, uh, that's a form of aggression. That's, that's a form of racism. Uh, so do you say, well, it, you know, you can be punished because you didn't say hello to people. You know, how do you broaden it uh, to capture everything without destroying the ability to have uh, public discourse? You can't. Secondly, the notion that trying to censor bad speech or bad expression uh, is gonna get rid of it, what we know it does is it drives it underground. A racist, if they know they can't say a racist thing in, in the Oakville Public Library, doesn't mean they, the, the ideas go away. And if they're, in a, if they're in a university or in a workplace where they can't express those views, we can have the illusion that things are better, but they aren't, they often are driven underground, they often are driven to associate more with people like themselves and the views get more virulent. Um, in the university in which I work, you know, the, most of the men pride themselves on not being uh, gender biased uh, and so forth. But the reality is any of my women colleagues will tell you at a university, there's a lot of gender bias still in the university. It's just unlike in certain other workplaces, most men are sophisticated enough they don't express those things, but it doesn't mean we've gotten rid of them. And if you look at the difference, differential pay levels of women academics as opposed to men academics or who gets promoted earlier or whether you see that there continue to be problems uh, of sexual discrimination, gender discrimination, uh, even though we've uh, gotten rid of a lot of the expression of it. Thirdly, censorship tends to draw more attention to the personal ideas of concern. Let me go back to Jim Keekster, this horrible anti-Semite who got fired. His case was before the courts for 12 years. And he would be the first and did tell people, that was the best thing that ever happened to me because suddenly, instead of talking to a handful of people in my class about my ideas, millions of Canadians were hearing about it because all of this coverage of the court case was in our media. Or there was another case, I don't know, well, there's only a few of you who might remember um, in the 1980s, there was a terrible Holocaust denier in Toronto named Ernst Zundel. And at that time, we had a law in Canada against what we now call spreading false news. And he was charged under that for his Holocaust denial. And so his case was very high profile. And ultimately, the law was found to be unconstitutional. But he subsequently was deported on other bases for, for his views. But one of the things he said when he was leaving Canada is the best thing that ever happened to me was to be charged because it, before I, I sat in my basement, he said, 
with a Gestetner machine. Now, most of you are probably not old enough to know what a Gestetner machine is, but it was a predecessor of a photocopy. It was a way you could crank things out, uh, copies of things. I produced these and I hand them out on the street corner in Toronto, and maybe 50 or 60 people would see them. Hundreds of thousands of Canadians saw my ideas and got to consider my views as a result of being charged. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. Censorship often victimizes. If we legitimate censorship as a way of dealing with things, we often victimize those we are trying to help. In a number of countries, the people who are charged are Palestinian activists who are charged with being anti-Semitic. Um, in the United States, when universities in the 1990s introduced speech codes to try to deal with issues of racism, the University of Michigan was one of the first, the first 10 people charged were all blacks, charged for being racist against whites. The attempt to use censorship as a way of stopping certain kinds of speech tends to get to be used by the majority against marginalized people's expression more often than, than otherwise. We see this in the books that get challenged. These are the five most challenged books uh, in the latest report of the American Library Association. So the, the first is genderqueer. Um, and uh, the author in that is, uh, it's an autobiographical book. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. It's a graphic novel about the author's uh, journey of self-identity, uh, how to come out to their family and society uh, as a trans person, um, and trying to explain what it means to be non-binary and asexual. The second most challenged book is Lawn Boy by Jonathan Evison. And this is the story of a 10th generation uh, rural boy who has a Mexican name, uh, raised by a single mom on an Indian reservation. It's really a novel, it's sort of a humorous novel, but about the real difficulties faced by a young person in, out of a, in a working class background in the United States. The third most challenged book is uh, George Johnson's uh, All Boys Aren't Blue. This book has won, I have a, I mean, this is a list of the awards it's won. Um, and it's about, uh, uh, Johnson is an LGBTQ activist, uh, and he explores his childhood and adolescence and, and university years in, in the United States, and deals with topics like gender identity and toxic uh, masculinity, uh, and brotherhood and family and marginalization and black joy. The fourth most challenge is Out of Darkness. Uh, Out of Darkness uh, is Ashley uh, uh, Perez's really interesting novel. It, it's really a um, um, Romeo, and Ju Romeo and Juliet story. The uh, Juliet is a Mexican-American girl and the Romeo is a black boy. And they're in a Texas town in 19, a small Texas town in 1937. So I don't have to tell you more about the story to get a sense of, of the, uh, what it's about and the complexities of the life they faced, uh, given who they were and that they wanted to have a relationship with each other. And the last of them is Angie Thomas's The Hate You Give, which uh, many of you will know about, about a 16-year-old uh, girl who was living in two worlds. She was uh, from a poor family, but was able to go to a sort of upper class suburban uh, high school. Uh, and she witnessed uh, a fatal shooting where, where uh, one of her childhood, uh, shooting of one of her childhood best friends uh, at the hands of a police officer. It raises issues of, of uh, the police and police uh, violence uh, against black people. Uh, gets into a lot of interesting, very thoughtful discussion of those issues. That's the fifth most. So we, if we, when we create a, a means of getting rid of hateful things, and a lot of people, a lot of people who are progressive like me, uh, unlike me, want to censor things that they find offensive, when we have a censorship regime, actually it's these things that represent marginalized views that are most often censored. So we create a mechanism that allows for censorship, but it actually victimizes the very people that uh, many of us are, are arguing we're trying to protect through censorship. It also can cr uh, create free speech martyrs in the public mind. Uh, people who are censored are often seen, be, there's a certain sympathy for them. Uh, I don't know if you, uh, any of you have heard of Abigail Schreier's book, uh, 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 what is it, Irrefutable, or no, 
you know, just and I'm I blocked on the name. It's it's a book about it's a book critical or, or seed is transphobic, um, and there's been campaigns in various libraries across the country to get rid of it. It's a not a very good book. Fifty oh. people in Canada may have read it. Irreversible. Irreversible damage. Yes, that's it. Um, it's the kind of book that it would have a tiny audience had it not become the major focus of censorship campaigns. And now it sells in the thousands um, as a result of the attention that it got by virtue of this. So not unlike, just another version of Ernst Zundel's story about how charging him actually helped him. The other problem with censorship is it denies us the opportunity to see and consider different viewpoints. How would I develop a criticism of Abigail Schreier and her transphobic approach if I couldn't read her book, if I couldn't get into a debate or a discussion with somebody about it, if I didn't have to formulate my own expression, if I just say, well, I hear it's transphobic, so it shouldn't be allowed. That doesn't allow me to develop or give me the ability to fulfill my responsibility to develop a critique of it. Again, if we go back to public discourse being the foundation of a democracy, we have to be able to debate. So if we think something's wrong, we have to say why it's wrong. Uh, and we can only do that if we can consider it. And then perhaps the most critical question of all, if we're going to say some things aren't to be allowed in the library or aren't to be allowed, who gets to decide that? Who in a democratic society has the authority to say, nobody in Oakville has a right to read this book because I find it offensive? Who am I to say that? Who are we prepared to give the authority uh, to deny people access to material? That's a fundamental question that anybody who's calling for censorship has to be able to, to answer. And then last, uh, and it's the point I was saying earlier, um, it gives a fault, censorship gives the illusion that we're solving a problem when we're not solving a problem. And it lets us avoid having to address the real world ways of solving. So I just want to end with a little note here for any library staff who happen to see this presentation. You know, what does all this mean for public library staff? You know, you have collections that can be challenged or displays or programs or space rental. And I think for library staff, it means several things. First of all, things you have to know. You have to familiarize yourself with your library's policies and core values. Secondly, you have to recognize that public libraries are public spaces. They're unique, as I was trying to say at the beginning, and socially vital public spaces. And the materials, facilities, and services of which you have a professional and constitutional, professional and constitutional obligation to ensure, to ensure are available to everyone in your community without discrimination. Every library patron possesses the right to voice their concerns. So if somebody comes in and wants to get rid of Abigail Schreier's book, or somebody comes in and wants to get rid of, uh, of um, the hate you give, you have an obligation to listen to them to hear their complaints, to show respect for them. They have a right to those views. You, don't, you shouldn't be expressing your viewpoint, getting in debate with them. You should simply be listening to what they have to say and then engage them in a meaningful dialogue about what the library is and what its policies are and why we don't just get rid of books because somebody doesn't like them. In fact, if Oakville got rid of, if the Oakville Public Library got rid of every book that somebody in Oakville didn't like, you would have very few things left in your collection. And then fourthly, I think you have to inform them. You have to focus on the issue of choice, diversity of views, freedom of expression, and explain the library's intellectual freedom policy, and explain why censorship is a two-edged sword. You're not going to agree, but you just have to lay that out there. And lastly, if that doesn't resolve the matter, you have to refer them to somebody in the management team. And if they're not available, you either have a form where they can register their, their challenge or their complaint, or you can take it, you know, they may not feel comfortable, they may not be literate, they may not feel comfortable writing it. You say, well, I'll gladly take it down and I'll make sure it's followed up upon. So I have a closing comment. That is, public libraries have a core responsibility to ensure that all people, everyone in their communities has access to the full range of knowledge, imagination, ideas, and opinion so they can meaningfully participate in public discourse on which genuine democracy depends. This is their human right. Intellectual freedom and free expression rights are a protection for the marginalized, making demands for social change and challenging majoritarian authority. Abandoning protection for intellectual freedom and free expression for whatever reason undermines the very possibility of social, democracy, of social justice and a genuine democracy. So I'll end there. If there are questions that come up that you, know, you think of afterwards, please 
that's my email address. I'd be happy to respond to anything you would like to raise. But right now, I'm looking forward to talking with Jeff. One of the biggest challenges I know that our librarians have, uh, and I think in society in general, is the is the um, uh, the issue around access for children in particular. Right. I do remember recently uh, I had as the board chair as well as a counselor, I had a, a very irate uh, parent who, who was quite upset about a graphic novel uh, that was uh, in our Iroquois Ridge branch. And I can't remember, does anybody, um, it's a fairly popular graphic novel. No, you don't, you didn't hear the complaint, some of our staff, no. But also there's, there's more challenges around graphic novels and, and young adult uh, fiction in almost any other category. Absolutely, so there is. And probably a lot of candidates for the yeah. <laughs> one you're trying but, to But I was, I was trying to get a handle on this yeah. particular one okay. because this, this, this graphic novel is very popular. Right. It sells extraordinarily well. Uh, it probably deals with some social issues that maybe, you know, maybe some younger folks should have access to, but there are some pretty significantly offensive in the minds right. of some people imagery in this graphic novel. Mm -hmm. And the argument in the particular, in this, uh, the argument in particular with this particular one is, was that it was on display in an area that was accessible to all, all, right, uh, ages and stages right. in the library. How do we reconcile that with with what is a declaration of, of human human rights? Librarians spend a lot of time thinking about that issue. Mm -hmm. That's why some things are in the children's collection and some things are in the young adult section, and some things are in the adult section, mm -hmm. where things clearly are inappropriate for children. They're put in the adult section. I think these challenges come up where something's in the young adult section or in the children's section that a parent thinks, well, that shouldn't be there. Young adults shouldn't be reading about these sexual matters or, or whatever. Uh, and then I think librarians have to use their own uh, collections policies and research to decide whether the complaint is legitimate or not. Where, what are the boundaries with regard to what children take out I don't think a library has a choice but to say, well, they have to rely on parents and parents' oversight and parents' discretion. But where things are clearly inappropriate, they shouldn't be there. And sometimes people, the library makes a mistake and has something that should really be in a young adult section, in the children's section, or something that should be in the adult section. And they, you know, when a challenge comes in, they have to look at that, look at the material. Typically, they'll, they'll look at reviews of that particular piece, mm -hmm. how other libraries have dealt with it in order to come up with it. It's not going to please everybody. And for a lot of people who have very, what we call strict standards, they're going to be unhappy that certain things are available, but then they're unhappy about sex education curriculum in schools. Uh, one of the major sets of challenges faced by libraries in Canada right now <clears throat> is coming from a group called Action for Canada, mm -hmm. which was an anti-masking, anti anti-vaxxer group that has taken up the cause of getting rid of the uh, 62 books that are part of a curriculum in the, in the British Columbia educational system, Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity, SOGI. There are 62 books that are part of that curriculum, and they feel that none of those should be able to be looked at by young people. And so they're sending letters, uh, they're called Notices of Personal Liability, to the principals of school libraries and the CEOs of public libraries saying, you're creating, a, you're violating the criminal code in Canada by making these, having these books available in your library because they're obscene and they violate the, the criminal code provisions of obscenity and you can be charged. Now, first of all, they're dead wrong on all 62 of them. Secondly, ironically, they're saying that is a violation of the extortion provisions of the criminal code. Yeah. Um, but nevertheless, they feel strongly about it. And they want to get these things out. So we're going to, I mean, there's always a debate about where the boundaries are and whether, and, and librarians have an obligation to look at that and look at what best practice and what, not just what the standards are in their particular community, but the broader standards in our society for deciding that. And it depends a lot on the particulars of, a, of yeah. an individual book to yeah. sort it out. Those are very practical applications of it. Right. Let's dial that back to the, 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 the principle behind it. And if, if, if uh, the declaration that you refer to from, and, and, and I don't disagree with you, just to yeah, yeah, know, no, this, this is where, no, this is where no, I'm pushing. Okay, that's okay. Yeah, I'm I, want, I, just want to, I just want to challenge yeah. a little bit here. So if, if and, and this is extraordinarily, uh, reasonable approach and I think our librarians for the most part take this and yeah. from what I understand even that just to finish that story about that graphic novel I think it was an error 
that it was happened to be there. Yeah. I think that's what it turned out to be. But let's let's just let's just poke at this a little bit. So if the if the declaration I can't remember which the declaration, declaration the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Thank you. If that declaration suggests that that uh, there should be intellectual freedom and all information should be equally available to all with no discrimination of age, discrimination of age how do you well, reconcile? I don't, I don't know if it says no discrimination of age. I thought that was one of the one of the I tests. Mean, what, well, I mean, we wouldn't expect a three-year-old to have access to certain kinds. Of, I mean, there's a recognition that, uh, but there can't be sort of a, a, a declaration that nobody until they get to be an adult can read any political science or right. you know that kind of stuff. But on the other hand, uh, uh, you know, your, I'm sure your library recognizes there are certain things that are not appropriate in a children's section. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that violates the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, to say that. I guess one of the things I didn't say, there's no society on earth where there aren't limits to expressive freedom and to, to intellectual freedom. Mm -hmm. The real debate is about what are, the, what are those limits? Mm -hmm. And that's why I talked about hate speech, because there's a debate about that in Canada. The default position is no limits, but there has, so there has to be a, a positive reason to impose limits, and they have to be minimal um, and necessary, and broadly in some pretty tough sta uh, standard of what necessity would look like. Right. Your library has a variety of limits on mm -hmm. uh, what what it puts in. I mean, if if something is just an outrageous piece of junk, uh, that may be a Holocaust denial or whatever, but it's just outrageous. But I imagine you have a, a copy of Hitler's Mein Kampf in your library, and you should. There's no way anybody could study 20th century. European history without being able to, and to say, well, we can't read anything that's written by Nazis. Well, how are we going to understand that phenomenon? How are we going to prevent that happening elsewhere if we can't read about it and understand about it and know about it? So reasonable limits, in, <coughs> particularly around children, yeah. uh, and the appropriateness for their, their brains to be able to synthesize the information, um, that would be an appropriate limit. Yes, yeah. uh, but also recognizing that thinking that by, for example, putting heavy duty filters on your computers for children, is going to ensure that children don't see inappropriate things. Right. Uh, I, I grew up in an era long before computers where we'd sneak into drugstores and look at books, <laughs> magazines on the shelf to see things that we weren't otherwise to see. And I'm sure kids find all sorts of ways of getting hold of mom or dad's iPhone or computer or other things. So, I mean, we have to put it in the, in the context of what the reality of our world is and, and uh, we don't want to adopt standards to protect against things that turn the library into something that it shouldn't be, which is a guardian to keep people away from information rather than to have the default position people have access and, and the burden of proof is anyone who wants to uh, limit that. Well, let me, no, let me just, let me just poke a little bit <coughs> yeah, more sure. of this and then I'll get off this topic, but let's, let's talk about the, the, you know, this whole issue of appropriateness for children. Who, who, the arbiter of that, I guess, are parents and society in general. But what, what about in the case where you mentioned sex education before? So right. sex education, whether it's uh, children coming to terms with their own sexuality, their sexual orientation, etc. I remember, I'm probably not that much a different age of you, because uh, I remember back when there were no computers yeah. and, and, you know, movies were restricted and those things never showed up on TV. Right. and until City TV came along with blue movies after right. midnight yes. and we stayed up really late to <laughs> yeah, catch, I remember that. catch something. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, in the case of, of the sort of sex education, the argument that some pose is that the material needs to be available to children mm -hmm. um, so that they can help form their own decisions in, right. their, in their lives. Um, you certainly back in the 80s, I don't know what year this was, but I remember this... Uh, uh, was an issue where I was growing up in Windsor. There was a, a sex education book out of Germany called Show Me. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever heard of it or not, yeah, but it has pretty explicit pictures in it. Yeah. And I remember that it used to sit on all the library shelves in Windsor. And I, I, and I was quite young at the time. And I remember kids would say, oh, you got to go check out this book because it's, you know, it's got all these great things in it. Uh, and some of them could be considered child pornography as well right. because they were pretty free, free flowing. But there was a controversy and it, it, it blew up. People right. in the town were incensed about this. And the demand was to actually get rid of it, ban right. it. It's horrible. Um, and eventually, what libraries did is they said, we're going to put it on the back shelf. Does that serve children well, though? Well, I mean, first of all, one has to, a library, if they get a challenge, has mm -hmm. to determine whether this is a serious piece of work or something that shouldn't have, that got through their selection process that shouldn't have gotten through it. Right. Not because of the content, but how badly the content was dealt with. Mm -hmm. 
how to deal with that, you know, all these books go through reviews. There are various psychologists or sex ed experts who comment on this. So libraries are guided by what experts in the field say about mm -hmm. the appropriateness. And certainly we're at an era now where most of us recognize that it's not healthy to withhold information from children about sexual activity. You know, you, it may be proportionate at certain ages, mm -hmm. but the the you know, and it never, never was actually withheld. You know, you, uh, in the 1950s, I'm told that uh, the code for movies prohibited a married couple from sharing a double bed. They that's had right. to be in single beds. Yeah. Remember that Dick, the Dick Van Dyke show on yeah. television as well. Yeah, that's right. But I mean, do you think there was any less sexual promiscuity or sexual deviancy, as it was called, in the 1950s than now? or you think about the Victorian era. Uh, so there's no relationship necessarily between behavior and the rules. That is, imposing these censorship rules doesn't get rid of bad behavior, but it often does what you were, I think, suggesting pre prevents or gets in the way of the proper development of uh, knowledge and understanding of these things. Let's let's move on to a different a different area, okay. and this is one that we became, this is a, a, a catchphrase that became very popular in the last couple of years: the concept of fake news. Um, and you you wrote an interesting blog article in May 2020 talking about uh, making it illegal to will not stop the spread of inf misinformation. That's right. um, and I want to explore that a little. Okay, bit. good. So, and you you did reference it in your in your presentation today. I mean, we all. We all endured that time, particularly right. with one particular, you know, orange president right. um, uh, during that period where it seemed that you really had to test almost every notion that came out of the White House, out of American media, out of American news. You made this claim, and I, I think I get it, that making illegal will not stop the spread of misinformation. But what do we do about it? And let, well, let, okay. let me say one more thing. Because I, I get the notion around the freedom of expression and the, and the freedom of speech, but when you've, got, when you've got a person of significant power like a Donald Trump making a comment that suggests that injecting bleach is going to somehow solve the COVID problem, is that really something we should be protecting? Okay, I mean, that's a really important question. Yeah. Um, the, the problem of fake news is a very old problem, as you may recall in that article. The first law against the spread of misinformation was, pa public, was passed in 1274 right. as part of the Statutes of Westminster. Uh, it was really to, so you couldn't say fault, you couldn't say certain things about the king. Or other distinguished, what was it, other distinguished other, gentlemen? Other distinguished yeah. gentlemen. Yeah. Uh, and it gave, it, it led to two branches of law, one to defamation law and one to spreading of false news. Uh, that remained part of the uh, law in the UK until the late latter part of the 19th century. And they got rid of it because it was totally ineffective as a way of dealing with the problem. There was no, it, it didn't stop fake news or what we call fake news or disinformation. And they got rid of it. But at the time they were getting rid of it, the Brit who was developing the Canadian criminal code was doing his work at that time. And he incorporated, incorporated it in his recommended law for Canada. So we had, we continued with that law until the 1980s when the Zundel case mm -hmm. caused it to be ruled unconstitutional here. Because who determines what's misinformation? Now, I have no trouble in agreeing with you, if that's what you were suggesting, that a lot that came out of the orange president's mouth was misinformation or the old cliche, how do you know if Donald Trump is lying? Are his lips moving? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but Adolf Hitler yeah. would have defined misinformation and criminalized misinformation that contradicted his views about Jews. Mm -hmm. It's a two-edged sword. Uh, so if you give the government the right to define certain information as misinformation and to put people in jail or fine them or whatever, well, there are a number of governments I wouldn't like where that would go, whether it be in China or Myanmar or what's currently happening in India. Or, or Iran. Or Iran. Yeah. Uh, or in some of the states in the United States right now. True. So it's, it's really difficult. Uh, you know, one of the problems more generally about censorship 
I guess I'd put it possibly, almost everybody believes in freedom of expression until they come across expression they don't like. Mm. And almost everybody's opposed to censorship unless what's being censored is something they hate, and then it's okay. Uh, but censorship is always a two-edged sword. So if you open the door to it and you see it as legitimate, then it's going to be a tool that those in the majority are more likely to use against minorities than the reverse. I mean, that's a philosophical argument against it, but the practical argument, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, misinformation has been around for thousands of years, continues to be around. The modality by which it spread changes. There was a huge uptake in the spread of misinformation after the printing press was developed. In fact, the rise in anti-Semitism was remarkable after the printing press. There was the emergence of anti-Semitism in all sorts of places that had welcomed Jews and so on after the printing press and material started getting out and having wider diffusion. And it took almost 100 years to figure out how to deal with that. And I think we're in a similar period now. Social media and the internet have created the ability to spread and amplify content in a way unknown in human history. And we're just continuing to grapple with it. And, you know, the federal government uh, brought in uh, ideas of what they were going to do with uh, to regulate the, so the platforms, the social media platforms to diminish the spread of uh, some of this horrible stuff. And what they brought in would have caused the main problems to solved. It re got a lot of criticism. It died on the order papers when the election, last election was called. And then Mr. Trudeau announced that this was still a priority for his government. They bring in the new legislation within the first 100 days. Mm -hmm. That hasn't happened. They, invited, they created an expert panel to recommend how to deal with these problems. Uh, a lot of eminent Canadians sat on it. They didn't agree what to do. Uh, the minister uh, responsible for this, the heritage minister, Mr. Rodriguez, has promised that before the end of the year, the legislation will be brought in. But the reality is, Nobody knows how to do it in a way that can be effective, that isn't harmful to public discourse, and yet allowing it to go ahead is harmful in all sorts of ways. I mean, whether it encourages people to drink bleach or what we see in, in Indian of, of a, a strongly nationalist Hindu uh, positive government that is causing horrific things to happen to Muslims who live in the country. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many harms. So we're, we're caught between a rock and a hard place here that if we try to get rid of it through censorship, that's not going to work very well and it's going to have other problems. If we, do we want to turn Google and Facebook into the censors of our society so they get to decide what gets heard and what doesn't get heard, which is the current thinking of the federal government, that they will have an obligation to take down harmful content and there'll be very severe penalties if they don't do that. Uh, our government was talking about finding them 5% of their global annual revenue. Wow. So if that were passed, they would have a default position of taking down anything that might be offensive. Mm -hmm. And that'd be chilling for sure. Well, and you know, the irony is the social media platforms actually have been a major cause of the proliferation of hateful, extreme, hyperbolic, outrageous content, because that was, attracts people. When I was a young person in Toronto, I would watch CBC and CTV, and occasionally I'd watch the Buffalo News. And I was really struck when I watched the Buffalo News. It was about fires and robberies and murders. And I wonder why are, you know, where's the national, you know, what's happening internationally? Where's the stuff I see on CBC News? You certainly were watching City TV. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the thing is, they knew something yeah. that we all know now. That's what people watch. Yeah. Yeah. You know, our, our adrenaline goes up when we see fires or murders or that kind of thing, not when we hear a detailed analysis of the situation in Myanmar. Yeah. And Google and Facebook know that well. So their algorithms prioritize and send to us the things they know will get us going because then we stay on their site longer. So now we want to say, well, this is a big problem. We want, we're going to turn it over to you to solve it for us. Well, I'm not so keen on that. I don't, I don't want Google or Facebook deciding uh, what can be seen by the public. Which yet, yet they do. Well, they already yeah, have enormous yeah. impact yes, on it. Yes. Uh, I live in a small condo of 12 units. There's only two of us who even subscribe to a newspaper. Uh, Ira Basin, a CBC uh, producer, um, had a really interesting program a few years ago where he interviewed young people about where they get their news. 
And for most people under 40, the answer was overwhelming from social media. Mm -hmm. And he, he asked them, well, how do you know if it's accurate? Well, we just look at what's trending. And then he did interviews with some major corporations like Coke and Pepsi, <clears throat> who no longer have to have ads about why um, uh, soft drinks don't cause obesity. They put out content that seems to be authentic through social media that spreads that message mm -hmm. uh, and can target it for young people and for particular audiences. So, so the ability to target, the ability to diffuse information, to amplify it, and mystify what its source is. Not an ad anymore, it's a, right. it's a story and 10,000 people have retweeted it, so it must be right. How do we, how do we cope with that? Well, I, I just don't think turning the problem, saying, well, you have to solve it, we're gonna penalize you if you don't get rid of misinformation, uh, is a fix we want. But what is a fix? Well, uh, we have lots of ideas of various components of a fix, but no good ones about what would be a real fix. Oh, I thought you were gonna give us a solution. I, well, I wish I could. <laughs> Our center uh, at uh, Toronto Metropolitan University has created an online harms network that's brought together 30 of the major groups in North America to come together to talk about, and we share, but nobody has solution. We have different ideas mm -hmm. and so forth, but it, it's a, this is why a public discourse about this is so important. Yes. Because something has to be done, something is gonna be done. What's gonna be done is not gonna necessarily be the right thing. And so we have to have the ability to talk about it and criticize it and evaluate and put forward new ideas. It's a collective problem we as a society have and have to figure out what to do, and we're nowhere near doing that. Oh, I miss the days when the internet was all about funny cats. Yes. And now it's about spreading misinformation potentially. Well, or think of all the people who, who have a, a lump or a pain or yeah. whatever and go onto the internet to find what Dr. it is. Dr. Google. <laughs> Often convinced they're dying yeah. when they're not dying or else convinced they're all okay if they drink this potion or whatever. Yeah. But then, you know, we had people selling what they used to call snake oil medicine um, a hundred years ago. But we're, but the, I guess- But it doesn't get around like the that, social that, media. That's, the, that's the difference. That's, that's the, 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 you know, the, the guy media, who, the, with, with, with apologies to Marshall McLuhan, the, the medium's the message in this particular well, yeah. case. And that's, that's a- I mean, the person would at a, at a county fair would sell yeah. some potion that they had concocted in their basement could harm a dozen people or 50 people who bought it there. But now they can have millions of people see it through social media. So the or scale. A, or have a president of the United States yeah. suggest that some snake oil idea yeah, is yeah. the solution. So I want to, I want to uh, touch on another topic that you raised and then we'll come to, we'll see if anybody okay, has questions. Okay. But I, just, I really want to get this one in because you mentioned the Freedom Convoy. Right. And this is obviously, this was a, it still is to this day, a big topic of conversation uh, in Canada. And it's mm. really polarizing people on political lines. Right. And political parties are shifting directions and, and a lot of those directions are, are based on the Freedom Convoy. So right. let's talk about that for a second. Okay. So, so obviously the people that, that felt strongly about issues that resulted in what became the Freedom Convoy right. have a right to express their opinion. Exactly. But where does that, this is, this is kind of like the old analogy, and I love this one because it affects my industry. Can you, freedom of speech ends when you yell fire at a crowded theater. Right. So what happens in, in this particular case, you have, you have all these people expressing their opinions, but it goes in many people's minds too far. It's less about, and, and I'm, I'm expressing an opinion and asking for you to feedback right. on this. It becomes in, in many cases less about the message or less about the, the protest or less about the, the expression of their, of their dissatisfaction and becomes more about becoming insurrectionists or whatever the case is in, in the minds of the public. I mean, mm -hmm. I'll give you a quick story. My daughter, uh, Sarah, is a sales executive at the West in Ottawa. Okay. That was ground central. Like it was, and we were terrified for her because <laughs> she had to go for work. She had to go to her car with her keys interlaced in her fingers because of the threats and the things that were happening down there. Those weren't protesters with, with you know, good thoughts in their hearts. This, right. These were people that were just out for some good old fashioned thuggery. Where is the dividing line here? In citing the uh, old line that came from a U.S. Supreme Court decision about you can't cry fire in a crowd theater. Yeah. The reason, what that is really saying is expression can be limited where it's gonna result in horrific consequences and there isn't a time to discuss it. Mm. So if you're in a theater filled with people and you yell fire, 
there's not a, people don't have a time to examine whether that's true or not, mm. talk about it, whatever. Mm. They're, they can be stampeded, as happened, as we saw at that uh, pitch in, uh, in Indonesia. Oh, that was terrible. Right? Yeah. 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 Where they were stampeded and died. Yeah. So it's, it, that's why the incitement of violence, the incitement to uh, uh, illegal action where it can happen suddenly or whatever is disallowed. So our, our courts have been very clear that you, threats of violence are disallowed. Other kinds of things. So that uh, any situation where your action can cause a lot of harm and there's no opportunity for anybody to refute it or discuss it or examine it is a restriction. What the folks in, who came to Ottawa did, and there were a lot of people, I mean, there's a lot of confusion, a lot of, uh, from my point of view, a lot of confusion, a lot of well-intentioned people who generally felt that wearing masks or uh, having vaccine mandates were an infringement on their rights or they had medical reasons, they thought that was wrong and the government shouldn't do that. I remember a friend of mine many years ago who was a, a member of the Ontario legislature when the government brought in seatbelt legislation. Mm. He said, in my, all my years in politics, I had more calls that week than I ever had from, you can't impose that on me. Mm -hmm. um, right? So there is that notion of freedom means uh, sort of a libertarian, I can do what I want, and if I'm not harming somebody directly, you, the state has no right. Now, I don't think that's freedom as I understand it. It's certainly not a social justice conception of freedom. Because freedom is not just the absence of government limitation so that everyone has the same freedom whether they're rich or poor. Freedom is only meaningful if it's a reality for everybody. So saying that, well, everybody uh, has the freedom to, uh, uh, to say whatever they want. Well, if you're a poor person or you're in a vulnerable job or you don't have access to any media, uh, that's sort of a hollow uh, claim, mm -hmm. whereas uh, somebody who has a lot of money, who owns a newspaper at the <laughs> extreme, uh, who's a university professor, has a lot more freedom to express this. So how do we create a system in our society where we can have a public discourse where the voices that often don't get heard from marginalized communities, we can build in ways to help amplify those voices so that they can be an equal part of the conversation. So in my view, freedom has is not just a negative right, that you have a right that can't be limited, but there's a positive aspect to it to ensure that everyone has not only the right to engage their opinion, but an opportunity, a meaningful opportunity to do so, which may be denied to them because of poverty or because of uh, racial or ethnic uh, hostility in the society or whatever. So I don't, I'm sort of wandering away from, yeah. <laughs> from your question. So the folks who came to Ottawa uh, said they had a right to express themselves what they did, but they violated all sorts of laws. Mm. And because they were there with these huge trucks, the police didn't have a way to deal with it. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a matter of their, it wasn't narrowly a matter of their expression. It was a matter of them illegally taking over the Capitol, mm -hmm. uh, denying people who lived there a variety of rights and safety and concerns that should have been dealt with that they couldn't deal with. Mm -hmm. That was the problem. And it got mixed up. Well, you're interfering with my freedom. No, we're not interfering with your freedom. If you'd wanted to come and stand on Parliament Hill and express yourself or hand out leaflets or whatever, no one would have interfered. But when you want to park big rigs, block the center of the city, put people in danger, threaten them uh, with violence and all these other things, well, that's not part of freedom. Mm -hmm. So I think it's that got sort of lost in the shuffle. Sure did. In, a, in an important way. We're still discussing it. And, and it's a problem for me. I'm, I'm the director of a center for free expression. And so a lot of times when I get introduced, people expect a libertarian who comes in and says, well, anybody can say anything and that's the end of the story. And that's not my message. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's great. So let's uh, actually ask our, our audience um, uh, if they have any questions. I certainly have a few other areas that we could probe, but I, I want to, uh, in the in the interest of freedom of expression, uh, see if uh, if our audience wants to chime in at all. Anybody want a piece of this, Pierce? Uh, what do you make of Elon Musk's move to take over Twitter? Sure. I must be <laughs> one of the few people who's really uninterested in that issue. It's not always clear that the CEO of a giant corporation can turn the nature of the corporation on a dime even if he wanted to. Um, 
I'm not sure what difference it would make. Uh, the question I put to people who are really exercised by it, I ask them, and I never get good answers, well, what could he do that would worry you? That's different than what is currently being done with Twitter. I'm not, I'm not aware, uh, you know, he, he purports to be more of a libertarian, mm -hmm. so he would uh, restrict Twitter less than it currently is restricted, but it, it sure is very restricted. Or it's, it's not only, it's not very restrictive, it's arbitrarily restrictive. Mm -hmm. So they removed Trump's um, access to it, but the generals in Myanmar still have access. Right. Uh, there's no consistency in how, the, I think that all the platforms are very political animals, so if they feel they're gonna take too much heat, um, they would rather not remove anybody and let, but if they take too much, they'll remove somebody, but it's not for any principled reasons, it's because of the kind of pressure. It was actually very costly for Twitter to remove Trump because he had what, 12 million or 50 million followers, so that brought a lot of eyes to Twitter. Yeah. Um, so they removed him because they felt they were under so much pressure they had to. Um, so the fact that he'd be less likely, there'd still be the pressure. I, 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 I would forecast that if he does buy it out five years from now, it, wouldn't, it won't appear to be fundamentally different than it is now, unless other things change as well. Except a lot of ads for Tesla. <laughs> yeah. uh, should, well, he's got the money to buy those. That's anyways, true. Yeah. So. Um, should, should Donald Trump have been banned from Twitter and uh, other social media platforms? Uh, there's few people who think less of the man than I do. So, in answer. Well, I don't know. We could probably... Yeah, uh, we could have a contest. We could have a contest. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of people who really like him. Uh, you know, he'd get 70 million votes. Yeah. For people that, that share his yeah. former profession, so, it's frustrating I'm, because... It's, I'm, I'm nervous yeah. about it, to yeah. be honest. His ideas still permeate our world. Yes. And they're articulated by all sorts of people. And they're... Himself. They're, they're getting into Canada. Uh, they certainly are. Yeah. Uh, and you're seeing him in the in the current election in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not sure banning him for, or removing him from Twitter actually had a significant diminution in the spread of his ideas. Mm -hmm. But it set a precedent. So if the Republicans get in or a right winger, uh, there's a really right wing control of one of the major social media, and they decide, well, they don't like the Democratic president of the United States, so they're going to ban him. Mm. They have such power because they reach so many people that their decisions, the decisions of their algorithms, which none of us knows and is totally inaccessible to us, affects all of our lives in all sorts of worrisome ways. Uh, so the additional thought, well, will we have the authority to ban anybody we don't like, uh, worries me. And that's the precedent that was set with Trump. And so I don't, I don't think... I, I would love if nobody ever heard another thing that man ever uttered, but I worry about uh, that as a way of, of dealing with Trump. I think we have to deal with the content of his ideas, be able to criticize those, be able to educate people about those, and shutting him up is a false way of thinking we've done effect something effective about Trump. Shutting him up in that fashion probably amplified his voice. Well, it amplified his voice and made a certain number of people who feel, you know, there are a lot of people who are seriously disadvantaged in our society. Uh, our economic system has negatively affected I mean, free trade. It caused lots of people who had good unionized jobs to not have jobs. We have r Rust Belt towns, they call them in the United States. We have towns like St. Thomas and others in Canada, where the, which had a lot of jobs that have lost them. Peterborough used to be a hub of massive manufacturing. It's all gone. Yeah. A lot of people are hurting about that are troubled by it, so somebody like Trump comes along. So there are a lot of people who I would say are good people who have political ideas that I think are terrible ideas. So there are good people on both sides. Well, <laughs> there are also a lot of racism on yeah, certain yeah. sides. Um, but so getting rid of his voice in that way will cause a lot of those people to think probably more fondly of him. Yeah. Well, if he's that dangerous to you, then you're trying to stop him, so maybe we should be listening to him. Yeah. You know, if you're saying that we aren't smart enough to figure out what he says is wrong, so you have to censor him, then maybe we should really be listening to him. Uh, and that point. often happens. So, uh, if I can just give you one other quick anecdote. Sure. You may remember a few years ago when a number of white supremacist racist organizations in the United States had a big event in Charlottesville, Virginia. And one of 
the white supremacist drove a car and killed somebody. Yes. Uh, a few months after that, some of those same groups wanted to have an event in Boston. And we're planning it. And there was a huge outcry that either the city government or the state government banned them from meeting, which they couldn't do under the First Amendment. And so it went ahead. And so what people did who were upset about it is they organized a counter event. And I think the best thing that happened was that it was able to go ahead because what people saw, the main event, these white supremacists, they saw a group of 30 or 40 or 50 older white men snarling <laughs> about blacks and what was happening in this country. And they also saw the counter event with tens of thousands of Bostonians out to talk about the importance of social justice and equity and their kids and so on. We were better off being able to see and contrast that than having prevented the one from being held, them feeling like modern, martyrs, some people around them, you know, like some of the, some of the convoy people may be thinking, well, geez, they're being treated badly. This is kind of like the theological argument that you can't have good without evil existing yeah. as kind of the same sort of thing. You can't recognize the danger unless it's, unless it's actually exposed. Well, yeah, and, and I don't want to be able to deal with Trump's bad ideas, bad policies, harmful ideas, by, by thinking, well, I'll just shut him up and then he'll go away. Right. I have to engage him and say what's wrong with him and convince other people. That's what we have to do in uh, a democracy if we're going to be victorious. Otherwise, Trump's going to win next time or yeah. Ron DeSantis or one of his clones. So um, I thought we still had like an hour left of our presentation, but I think that we're actually over time. I could go on for a long time. We're closing in 10 minutes unless you want to stay overnight. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but before we do, did I see a hand come up over here? Okay, let's take this last question and then we'll wrap up. How's that, Marcus? Okay. Thank you. Uh, recently in Oakville, there are very big news about a teacher oh dear. who dressed very improperly, protected as a freedom to express to expression or not. I, I mean, I thank you for that question. It's a really good and important question. Uh, I actually one of the most interesting educators I know. I asked to write a blog post for the Center for Free Expression's blog on that issue, which we just put up a few days ago. So if you go to cfe.ryerson.ca and go to click on blog posts, it's the most recent blog where, post where she addresses that issue. Mm -hmm. And what I found interesting about it, I, mean, I saw the pictures that, uh, which were outrageous. I mean, here it struck me, here was a person who was going through some identity crisis and trying to work it out and was working it out fairly badly. And in a context where schools have been trying to figure out for some time now about what are proper dress codes. I mean, a lot of schools had dress codes. A lot of, uh, of uh, separate schools still have dress codes. Um, is that appropriate? What kind, you know, I mean, there's a lot of, been a lot of discussion, debate about that that has never been resolved. Uh, and then a teacher comes in with an outrageous costume on uh, with huge breasts and nipple showing. I mean, they're prostheses and a tight sweater. Um, in the blog post, uh, her name is Daniel McLaughlin. She was the former director of education for the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. She said, well, you know, there are serious questions about what's appropriate dress for teachers, what's appropriate dress for students. But nobody asked the most important question in this person's case, was this per did this get in the way of the person's teaching his shop courses? Was he a good teacher? Were the students learning something? Uh, in which case, you'd, you'd look at his costuming differently than if he was a terrible one or if this was interfering with his teaching and fulfilling his duties as a teacher. Uh, and no, I never saw any reference to that, whether he was a wonderful teacher and kids loved him as a teacher or he was a terrible teacher. Or, uh, but that, that's the first question. And then the second question is, what are the limits? And I think the board took the right response. They have an obligation to address the question of professionalism and what standard of conduct they expect the teachers. And then they'd be in a position to deal with that. At the moment, they hadn't addressed that issue. So they didn't know what to do with this person who came in and dressed like a clown, um, a certain kind of clown. Yeah. Um, but they at least should have had the issue of, is that, is that person a good teacher? Mm -hmm. And is that person having some mental health challenges? They're going through an identity crisis. They acted out in this clownish, extravagant way. Maybe that's a sign 
the, of a person who's having some mental health issues, who's a good teacher, but is not knowing how to cope with their identity at the moment. And maybe they should seek some accommodation, some way of helping. I just didn't see that kind of discussion. All I saw was outrage at what were truly outrageous photographs uh, of this person. Great. Okay, well, James, I want to say thank you very much to uh, our special guest today, James Turk, for a wonderful conversation, uh, a, a riveting... Uh, uh, well, you're very kind. Uh, a, a wonderful slide presentation and some really good information to think about going forward. Uh, this is uh, wonderful for everybody that's joined us this evening. Thank you for being with us today and to the uh, audience on the internet, both staff and citizens uh, in the town of Oakville or around the world. Uh, thank you for tuning in and watching uh, our presentation today. This has been Conversations uh, at the Oakville Public Library and uh, I want to wish everybody a very uh, great Thanksgiving weekend. Thanks everybody. Mm -hmm.